Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Turn your Bibles, please, to James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6 this morning. It's page 1, uh, 1013 in the Bible in the chair in front of you. Love for you to follow along, love for you to turn there, especially on this one, because, uh, you know, this is a kind of a tough passage. I've heard that this passage was rewritten or like summarized and not quoted from the Bible, and the person that spoke it riled up such a, 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 a crowd that they wanted to throw him out. So I want you to see that thus says the Lord, not thus says Brian. All right? And here's a bit of a word of caution, okay? When we start talking about money and we start talking about riches, the natural instinct is to think, well, I'm not rich because I don't have everything I want. There are other people that have way more than I do. And then to begin to project onto them. People that have more than you do must be sinful, and you must be righteous. At least if you're like me. So a word of caution. Let's not compare how much we have to how much someone else has. And imagine that because they have more than you, that, that this applies to them. And man, you really wish they were here to hear it. All right? Let's all ask the Lord to help us see how we are doing with what we have. Amen? All right, let's read James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Thankfully, I already covered last week the judgment. Do not judge your brother. Who are you to judge your brother? We especially need to take that into consideration as we think about this because I think the temptation is there. Anyone that has more than you do, more than you think they ought to have, it's easy to judge. So here we go. James says, come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. See what I'm saying? All right, let's pray for the Lord to help. Father, we do come to you, one, giving you praise and honor and glory. Jesus, you are the Redeemer. And we come as the redeemed, redeemed by your blood. Help us now to hear your word and to treasure it. But not just to hear it and treasure it, but to do it. And I pray, Father, that you begin to soften our hearts now to hear and to heed. In Jesus' name, amen. So James said in verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So who is James writing to? Who does he write the letter to? The church. Now, who is he addressing here, though? Okay, There's debate. There's uncertainty who he's addressing here. Come now, you rich, weep and howl. So he did speak in the second person, you rich. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, come now, the rich of the earth. No, he says, come now, you rich. So he speaks in second person. So he expects, or at least there's thought that he expects the rich to hear. And who else would hear? this letter being read, if not people within the church. Okay? How you handle your money is a pretty good 
thermometer of your spiritual temperature. Let, let, me, let me put it like this, okay? There's a thermometer which gauges your temperature, and there's a thermostat that sets your temperature. How you handle money doesn't set the temperature. In other words, it doesn't make you right with God. But how you handle your money, how you think about money, gives you a pretty good indication of where you are with the Lord, of your, temp, uh, of your spiritual temperature. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus uses money as the chief alternative to God. What else could Jesus have supplied there to say you cannot serve this and God? Entertainment, sex, leisure, work, spouse, kids, all would be true. But Jesus knows that the allure of money is so strong. Why? Because it promises to do what only God can do. Here's what money promises to do. Fulfill you. Protect you. Provide for you. Secure your future. All of these things, money promises and fails to deliver. Jesus knows that the chief alternative to God is money. You cannot serve both God and money. So perhaps... James is writing to people in the church who would hear this rebuke. You rich. However, perhaps he's writing about people outside the church. The unbelieving world, perhaps. It's not uncommon for prophets to speak a word of prophecy that the people would never hear. A prophet would speak a word of condemnation over a nation that the nation would never actually hear. That's not uncommon. Additionally, James says, you rich as opposed to you brothers. So possibly, James is writing to people outside the church, not people within the church. He says, weep and howl rather than repent. Repent. What would we expect for a pastor to say to his people if they were living in sin? You would expect the pastor to say, repent and turn and find salvation. But what Pastor James says is not repent and turn and find salvation, but rather weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you in the day of judgment. He expects damnation, not salvation. So maybe he's speaking to people outside the church. Regardless who James has in mind, Christians within the church can stand to glean a few things from this exhortation. First of all, this is a poignant reminder that oppressors will not always oppress. The people that James rebukes, those who defrauded, Their time will come to an end. So that's the first encouragement for those in the church. The oppressors will not always oppress. Secondly, God knows and sees the plight of His people. God knows what Christians are going through. He knows what His people are experiencing. And He cares. And finally, we see here a reminder of God's holy standard as it comes to money. So this is one of those things where you... A smart man learns from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So Christians in the church were hearing this, and maybe James is writing about people out in the world, and he's saying, don't be like them. Remember 
who you are. So regardless of who James is speaking to, people in the church who claim to serve God but are really serving money, or people outside the church who don't claim to serve God and only serve money, there's still takeaways for those of us in the church who are following Christ with all of our hearts. Now, I also want to state that this is not an indiscriminate attack against possessions. This is not saying that it's sinful to be successful. It's not wrong to have possessions. What's wrong is when your possessions have you. It's not wrong to have possessions. What's wrong is when your possessions have you. It's not having money. It's loving money that gets people in trouble. Listen to the Apostle Paul to Timothy. For the love of money. See, sometimes we get this, we, we misquote it. You ever heard someone say, for, for money is the root of all, of all kinds of evil? That's not what the Bible says. Money can be used for all kinds of good. Paul said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But just a few verses later, seven verses later, listen to what Paul says. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to what? Enjoy. There's nothing wrong with receiving from the Lord, being blessed by the Lord, being fortunate, being successful, and receiving from the Lord and enjoying what He gives you. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul could have prohibited wealth in this passage. He could have said this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them to sell everything they have and take a vow of poverty just like their poor brothers and sisters. But that is not what Paul said. He says, charge them not to be arrogant and boastful and prideful and hope in their wealth, but rather to hope in their God. Huge difference. As you scroll through the history of the Bible, just as Pastor Andrew said, David was a man after God's own heart, but was a man of incredible means. Abraham was incredibly wealthy. Job was incredibly wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. Lydia was a successful businesswoman. It is not wrong. It is not sinful to be successful. It is not having money. It is loving money. It is not having money. It is hoping in your possessions and boasting in them and finding security. When we talk about boasting, I'll probably use that term a few times. When we talk about boasting, a lot of times we think, well, boasting is, is like standing up and saying, aha, I have more money than you. And you think, well, I don't do that. But when the Bible talks about boasting, it talks about finding your confidence and your hope in that thing. Like a king boasts in his chariots. Why? Because he has confidence that he will have great military success because he has a large army, capable army. So when we talk about boasting, don't boast in what you have. We're not talking about being flashy. We're talking about finding hope and security in what you have. Now, Jesus said in Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Paul says, charge the rich in this present life not to be, hard, not to be haughty, and not to, uh, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Jesus knows that where our heart is, or where our treasure is, there our heart will be. So when our treasure is in the gold and silver, or the IRA, or the bank account, 
that's where our heart is going to be as well. Paul says to those that are rich, hope in God. Now, this may not be a, a direct attack on wealth, but James does speak pretty severely, does he not? To the rich. He speaks pretty severely. And we'll get into what we mean by the rich in this context. Okay? Because it is more than just people that have money, because reality is that if I were to say the rich, that would apply to us. You understand? So James, when he says the rich, is talking about more than just people that are somewhat affluent. They have a certain mindset and they do really bad things. But let's jump into this here. He says, he, he says the rich. Why, why would the rich need to weep and howl? Why would they need to sob and lament? He tells us, for the miseries that are coming, what they have put their trust in and their hope in is going to disappoint them when it matters most. When you boast in your riches, when you find confidence in your riches, and you say, aha, I have amassed enough, and I never have to worry about money again, and nothing can, can hurt me, nothing can get through, I have plenty. On the day that it really matters, those riches will fail the rich. And that's exactly the message that Jesus demonstrates or illustrates with the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Let me summarize it for you. In Luke 16, Jesus tells about a rich man who has all that he could ever want. And his life is comfortable, and he has plenty of food, and he's luxurious. And just outside of his home at his gate sits a poor man who begs and is hungry and has nothing. And Lazarus is cold and hard to the poor man and indifferent. And they both die. And the poor man goes to heaven and he's comforted at the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man dies and he goes to Hades and he's in torment. And he looks up and says, Abraham, quench my thirst. Give me relief. I'm in agony. And Abraham says, there's a great chasm between us. Cannot do that. And he says that in this life, you had everything that you ever wanted. There was nothing you, you lacked. And in this life, the poor man, he had his bad things. But now, you are in agony, and He is comforted. The great reversal cometh, brothers. That is why the, re the rich should weep and howl. Because in this life, they have everything they want. And they're indifferent to the needs of people around them. But the great reversal cometh. And there will be a day in which they are in agony and the poor are comforted. And per the story of Jesus, there's going to be some recognition of this reversal. There's going to be some appreciation that I don't have something that he has that I really, really want, and there will be no end to this. Yes, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. James is so confident of the miseries that will come that he speaks as if they've already happened. It's as good as done. Look at what he says in verse 2. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Bro, Pastor James, bring in the heat. 
he identified three main sources of wealth. When he says riches, he's talking about agricultural riches. I think we can resonate with that. Right? Bumper crops. They, they have these fat, fat barns. And they're full of the harvest. And then there's these elaborate wardrobes that they wear to demonstrate their wealth. It's not unlike us. It's not unlike us. We demonstrate our wealth by what we wear in our society. Maybe not all of us, but I calculated my wardrobe today. No. $15 from Goodwill. That was a humble brag, and I apologize. So riches of the harvest, wardrobes, and then precious metals, gold and silver. You ever watch CNN or Fox News about 3 o'clock in the afternoon? They are trying to sell you gold hard, right? Because when, when everything drops out, gold is the only thing that's going to have value. Uh-uh, sorry, not according to James. He says your gold is corroded, it's rusted. Now there's irony there. Why is that ironic? Because gold doesn't rust. Exactly right. The Old Testament and, 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 and Jewish wisdom literature picks up on that irony of rusted gold. Why is that ironic? Why is James appealing to corroding gold? Because God in His judgment will do to gold what nothing else can rob it of value. Can you imagine a world in which gold means nothing? That's what James predicts as the miseries that are coming. Their wardrobes that they paid thousands and thousands of dollars for was dinner for moths, which are alive today and die tomorrow. And their barns that are overflowing with their corn and soy is rotten, and it's infested with worms. This is the language that James uses to rebuke those who are the rich in this context. The corroded wealth not only disappoints, but it actually multiplies the weight of judgment against them. It, it stands as evidence Exhibit A of why you are now in misery. Look at the corroded wealth. Look at the rotten riches. Look at those robes and dresses that are holy in all the wrong ways. Okay, Pastor Joe. They will be evidence against the wealthy, the rich. Rather than securing them, which is what they think that it's going to do, it actually serves to condemn them. The fact that it corroded is all the evidence that we need that it was not invested in things that mattered. Why? Because Jesus says that when you invest in the kingdom of God, it yields a thousand times return. Financial advisors, if you had a lead on a 1,000 time return, how much effort would you put at investing in that? Like everything, right? What is that? It's like 10,000% interest? Or 100,000? I don't know what it is. Financial advisors, what is it? Ten, a thousand times return? It's a lot. Right? Money invested in the kingdom yields a thousand times. Money that's hoarded doesn't even retain its own value. Paradigm shift, folks. Paradigm shift. Not only is wasted wealth going to witness against the rich, not only is it going to be evidence against them, it's actually going to eat your flesh like fire. 
they're going to be consumed by their own wealth. It contributes to their own damnation. That fire evokes Jesus talking about the flames of Gehenna, of hell, of torment, and this, this wealth that, that they look at and they see as this bastion of security and purpose and meaning is going to grow a mouth and eat them, consume them. How foolish is it to put your hopes in wealth? Usually biblical rebukes on the wealthy are not necessarily rebukes on possession. I think that I've adequately expressed to you that it's not about having, but rather about how you use it. It, 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 The rebukes are usually about misusing it. This hoarding up, this self-centeredness is what's being addressed here. It's self-centeredness of wealth that gets the rich into so much trouble with the Lord. While God's children are all around them, suffering in need and anguish and dying without hearing the gospel and going to hell themselves. The rich are fat and happy. They have all they need, not a care in the world, and they could care less about those who are suffering. It is this wealth James talks about, hoarding up the wealth creates not only rot in the barns, but rot in the heart. It rots the soul. You know, again, financial planners and advisors take heart. The Bible does not prohibit prudent financial planning. It does not prohibit providing for your family, working hard, finding a trade or getting an education and being successful in your field. It doesn't prohibit that. In fact, the Bible prohibits and rebukes men who fail to provide for their families. But the Bible is clear that when your primary orientation of wealth is self-focused, how do I use my money without any regard for how God wants you to use His money? That becomes an issue. The Lord gives us wealth with the purpose And what is the purpose? Provide for our families and support His kingdom. Provide for our families and support His kingdom. The issue is when all of that wealth received is funneled into provide for family. Provide for self. I'll let everyone else advance the kingdom. That's a problem. In Matthew 6, Jesus told us to not be anxious about the necessities of life, but rather to seek first, as in priority, the kingdom of God. What should matter most to a Christian is not my IRA, the kingdom of God. What should matter first is the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then Jesus said, you seek, first all, you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What's the message? Don't worry about the basic necessities of life. God knows you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God. Make sacrifices. Say yes to God, even when you can't see a way, and trust God to provide for you. That's the message of Jesus as it relates to your wealth. Jesus also warned, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus invites us to make a smart investment. That investment is in eternity, where it yields a thousandfold return, and where moth does not destroy and rust does not corrode, and thieves do not break in and steal. The problem that James rebukes in the rich is that they were not seeking first God's kingdom, and they were laying up treasure for themselves. He says, you have laid up treasure in the last days. 
Then James says, living in luxury and in self-indulgence. And what follows is two sets of parallels, each with an indictment about an evil attitude and an evil activity. I want to deal first with the evil activity and then we'll conclude with the evil attitudes because I think the evil attitudes is probably more relevant to most of us than the evil activity. So let's read verses 4 and verse 6. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So a small group of wealthy landowners basically consolidated all of the arable land under their ownership. And then they hired out the laborers to mow their fields and harvest their crops. But they defrauded the laborers by withholding their wages. Now these laborers were a lot of times migrants, and they were dependent on daily payment. So if I don't get paid today, my family don't eat tomorrow. And these these. Wealthy landowners who have fat barns. It's at harvest time. It, it, James implies it's at harvest time. They, 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 the harvesters, right? So the, the rich are bringing in the wealth. They're bringing in the food. They're raking it in. They know what the yield is. They know what they've made for the year. And they're defrauding the laborers which is exactly what God forbids in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and be guilty of sin." Listen to this tragically poetic language that James uses to rebuke these people. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers are crying out against you. So they bring in the harvest, they bring in the riches, and they've built up their savings account, they've got their deposits of gold, and and part of that gold, part of that wealth, is wages that ought to have been given to the laborers. And it's crying out to God, saying, I don't belong here. I don't belong in this depository of the rich. I belong in the hands of the laborers who earned it with their labor. And it's joined with another cry, that of the harvesters. It's like this pitiful duet. This is poetic language. The cry of the wages goes up to the Lord, and the cry of the harvesters goes up to the Lord, and they reach to the ears of the Lord of hosts. The rich think that they can do anything that they want to the poor. It's a tale as old as time. The rich think they can do whatever they want. They have the power, they have the position, and they can get away with their fraud because what are these laborers going to do? Can you really prove that you worked for me yesterday? I don't even know that you were at my field. Can you prove I didn't give it to you? I gave it cash. I gave it to everybody. What do you mean you didn't have it? Oh, you want to go to the court? Sure. Let's go to my buddy, the judge. They think they can get away with anything, but God is watching. And his ears are attentive to the cries of the poor. He is aware, you rich, of your schemes. How they use their wealth only for their own pleasure without any concern for the people around them. Two things that we can glean here. First, sometimes we have to settle for God's ultimate justice in His timing. Sometimes we just have to trust that God is a God of justice, but God is a God of justice. 
and we have to wait for him to be our vindication. So those who are oppressed, those who have been defrauded by someone else, when it seems like the world is stacked against you, it's not a pipe dream that you're waiting on the Lord to be your vindication because the great reversal cometh. Which brings me to my second point. The great reversal cometh for those who have defrauded as well. For those who are oppressing, the great reversal cometh. And the Lord of hosts, which is the title that David used when the little shepherd boy stood on the battlefield opposite of that great Goliath, and he calls him the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heavenly armies, hears the cries of the poor in this life. And the great reversal cometh. Now, while there may be some in this room or listening online who need to hear that rebuke and need to examine their hearts and say, how am I oppressing other people? I think that most of us relate more with the laborer than we do with the independently wealthy who have power and position and and are defrauding other people. However, when it comes to attitudes, I think that we can find more in common with the rich than we want to think. James said in verse 3 and 5, You have laid up treasure in the last days. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Is that not the American dream? Isn't this the modern-day American dream? Save up a bunch of money so that you can retire in luxury. Make some sacrifices today, but still live in as much luxury as you can while ensuring that when you retire, you live in even more luxury. Now listen, it's not a condemnation about retirement. I fully intend to retire at 82 and enjoy the final (laughs) weeks of my life. This is not an indictment about retirement. It's a mindset, right? There's an American dream. Live in luxury. Live in self-indulgence. Fatten your hearts indulge every whim you have meet every desire every desire is worth pursuing and sacrificing for that's the american dream look out for number one because if you don't ain't nobody looking out for you that's the heartbeat of our culture but be careful because an evil attitude An evil mindset, an evil way of thinking always precedes evil activity. And none of us should imagine that we are immune to taking on the evil activity that James rebuked of those who defrauded and oppressed people. Now notice that James makes a subtle contrast here. He says, you lived on the earth in luxury. Lived on the earth. What do you think? that James implies comes next. The great reversal, right? The torments of hell. When he says luxury, that's a self-indulgent, pampered, easy life. Whatever they wanted, they bought it. Wherever they wanted to go, they went didn't have a care in the world that they did not mask with wealth. But to live in luxury and self-indulgence is not Christian. I'll say it again. To live in luxury and self-indulgence is not Christian for a few reasons. Number one, it's selfish. Number two, it's not meaningful. And number three, it's quite deceptive. You ever wonder why in the wealthiest nation in the world we have such unhappy people? Suicide, depression, mental illness, hopelessness, all of these are endemic to the wealthiest nation in the world. 
We have been sold a bill of goods, folks. The American dream, the modern American dream, is a lie. And lies do not come from God. They come from Satan. We are fattening our hearts like fat cows in the slaughterhouse. Now that image is particularly relevant to me because I have two cows in my pasture and I'm feeding them, not because I like them as pets, but because I'm going to eat them one day. And they're sitting there thinking, man, life is good. Come on, Brian. Give me some more grain and sweet feed. Throw out some more hay. Man, we got life made in this pasture. Yes, get fat. Get fat. Sorry if you're vegan. I'll pray for you. If my cows had eternity on their hearts, if they had a concept of life and death, they would know this is dumb. This is not right. Let's figure out how to get over this fence. Which they probably could. But life is too good in the fence. Life is too good in the fence. Satan is fattening your hearts in the day of slaughter. To be so self-centered with your wealth that you don't care about anything. You, You don't care about the Lord. You don't care about His purposes. You don't care about people's needs around you. You don't care about the ministry that is supporting you and feeding you. Is a fool's paradise. It feels so good in the moment. But the great reversal is coming. Fathers, I know that it's difficult to hear this on a day when you're going to go home and there's going to be some dissonance because your wives are going to lavish you with gifts and meals and praise your name. And you're going to feel bad because you're going to say this is luxurious and self-indulgence. Look, it's good to lavish our loved one's from time to time. So take full joy, brothers, in the lavish love of your families today. But I'm actually grateful, dads, that it fell on today. You know, we just schedule these out. I don't say, okay, this date was for this message for for Father's Day, but I'm grateful that it did. Here's why. Fathers, we have so much impact on our families as it relates to how we view money and stuff and generosity and faithfulness and stewardship and trusting the Lord. We have so much influence in our home for good or for evil. Dads, you have an opportunity to change the trajectory of generations by how you think about wealth. Your kids are watching to see what does right look like? How should I relate to what I am being given, to to what I'm earning? How should I think about the whole concept of work hard, earn a living, provide for family, be generous to others? How do I think about all of this? Your children are watching you. We need wisdom from above, men, do we not? Because there's a fine line between being a good provider and being self-indulgent. The last thing that we want to do is teach our kids to fatten their hearts in the day of slaughter. A few things for us to reflect upon here as we wrap up. A few questions for you men, and this is posted online. You might need to go back and re-watch this. I want you to reflect. I'm reflecting. Some questions to reflect on. Am I hoarding money rather than seeking first the kingdom of God? Am I prioritizing my plans and my goals over God's? Am I concerned about reaching the lost 
the way that others were concerned when I was reached. Someone reached you with the gospel. Someone reached you with the gospel. I can guarantee you it took money to do that. In one form or another, it took money to do that. Are you as concerned about reaching other people as other people were, are, were concerned about reaching you? Am I supporting the ministry that supports me and my family? Are you being fed at this church, equipped, encouraged, challenged, rebuked? Are you learning? Are you growing? Is that worth supporting so that others can be the recipients of the same support of ministry as you are? Is there anything that I say no to in order to say yes to God? Is there anything in my finances that I have had to make a deliberate choice to say no to this so that I can say yes to God's kingdom? Are you living sacrificially at all? Or do you have the mindset that if there's something left over at the end of the month after I've met all my needs and all my wants, then I might give some to support my church and meet the needs of people around me? Wherever you're leading, dads, there's a pretty good chance that your children are going to go too. Where will they end up, folks? Fathers, where will your children end up if they follow your lead? Hear the words of John MacArthur, blind to heaven, deaf to warnings of hell, insensitive to the impending day of slaughter and judgment, the unrepentant, selfish, indulgent hoarders stumble blindly to their doom. Unless they repent, James warns, they will experience eternal damnation. Dads, I know that none of you want that for your children, and I want that for none of you. I want that for none of the generations that come after you. What I want instead is that they be like the man that Jesus described in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It was not a sacrifice for the man to sell everything and buy the field. Why? Because the field had surpassing value and worth. My question for you dads today is, does the kingdom of God have surpassing worth and value in your heart over all that you have? The lyrics of that song we sang just before this sermon, Christ Redeemer, said, When all the nations come, every kindred, tribe, and tongue, through every age, this anthem raise, Jesus bought me, redeemed by his blood. Imagine the scene standing in heaven, surrounded by people from every tribe and tongue and nation for all time. And they will have one anthem. We have been redeemed by the blood of the King. And how do we make that so, church? How does that happen? We seek first the kingdom of God. We send missionaries. We train up disciples to make disciples. And we populate heaven. Brothers and sisters, if your view of the kingdom of God, if the value of the kingdom of God does not surpass all that you have, my hope and my prayer is that the Lord would let you see with fresh eyes because it is. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming us by your blood. I pray, Lord, that you help us as we leave, as we, well, as we respond, but as we leave, to walk in this tension of being grateful for what you've provided and, and la being lavished 
uh, as fathers and enjoying some luxury and some self-indulgence today, but Lord, help us to not be consumed by it. Help us, Lord, to lead our families to see the surpassing worth and value of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.